Would you please pray with me? Almighty God, step off the pages of Scripture into our lives that we may see a righteousness that comes from you and from you and draw us to you that we may have joy in seeing what you've done and then so live our lives. In your holy name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Matt Emmons in the 2004 Olympics had the goal in sight. He had, was uh, participating in the three position 50 meter um, shot, rifle shot, and he had the goal right there. All he had to do was put the lead on the target. But in what is described as one of the most rare experiences in all elite sports, especially in his sport, he shifted just slightly and hit the wrong target. Do you know how many points you get for hitting the wrong target? Zero. He went from gold medal to eighth place because he hit the wrong target. Paul, this morning in Philippians chapter 3, wants us to understand that it doesn't matter how accurate you are if you're aiming at the wrong goal. And so he encourages us to shift from religion, to shift from self-confidence, to shift from earning to Christ and Christ alone. That's why he starts out and he says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and it's safe for you. He's reminding of us of the theme that he has throughout the whole of the book of Philippians. Rejoice in the Lord. Joy is not found in the past. You need to jettison those wrongs and those mistakes. It's not found in the present. It's not found in the worries that we have for today. We need to omit such worries. And it's not found in self-importance because we need to yield to others. That's what Jesus does. That's what we saw throughout chapter 2. Now, joy is found in the Lord. It's a phrase that he says throughout the whole book. Rejoice in the Lord. I, I am found in the Lord. I, I glory in the Lord. Everything is about being in the Lord. Indeed, righteousness is in the Lord. That's what we understand as you heard the gospel. Unless you have a righteousness that surpasses that of the Pharisees, you don't have anything. But that's what he, is the point. If you have Jesus, if you're surrounded by him, if his righteousness covers you, then you have everything. Good news is found not in the circumstances of today, because with all of the circumstances we have today, we need to be open-handed. We need to live with them without any sense of control, not trying to uh, manipulate circumstances, not trying to do things like that, but instead having a rock-solid confidence that everything comes from God. It's not earned, it's not gained, it's gifted to us. And that the real goal, the goal of everything is to know Christ. And so he starts out, follow with me if you will in Philippians chapter 3. We're going to start at verse 2. It says there in Philippians chapter 3, Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh... I have more. He's shifting us from the idea of religion, from doing to being. He wants us to understand and he, that doing more, especially when it comes to Christianity, just creates a self-perpetuating vicious cycle of trying to find some worth, some health out of doing more. And he wants us to understand that that leads to nothing. It's poison, in fact. It's not what you want in your Christian life. And so he starts out talking about dogs, evildoers, and mutilators. He is going right after a group of people, and he's saying, beware of the dogs. He's getting an image into their minds of a, a group of roving Jewish preachers who are doing one of two things. They're, they're either Jewish missionaries who are sent to Philippi to gain more Jewish converts, or they might be what they call the Judaizers, people who've had a taste of Christianity but are trying to synthesize it with Jewishness such that you have to keep the law and have Jesus, and somehow that'll make you uh, not mixed up and crazy. And he was, what he's saying is beware of all of those things. Beware of them. They're dogs. And he's flipping all of this, isn't he? This is what they would have called the Gentiles. 
The Jewish people said the Gentiles are the dogs, the Gentiles are the mongrels. And Paul is saying, no, 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 these Jewish leaders, they're the mongrels. They're the ones that are not good. Why is he so harsh? Sometimes it's hard to read in the Bible a passage like this because we go, wow, that's just kind of in your face. The reason he's in our face is because if you begin to live a life that's based on doing more for God, it's spiritual poison and it will lead you away from Christ. But instead, if you found yourself, set yourself on the works of Christ, then everything will work better. That's why he uses the word evildoers. He says, watch out for the dogs, watch out for the evildoers. He has in mind those who practice pagan practices, those who, like the prophets of Baal, you remember the story way back, they, they cut themselves and they do all kinds of things to their body to try to make God happy and to rain down the water that they need, and, and there's no health in that, literally. It'll hurt you. And what he's saying is, don't be like that. Don't be like pagans who try to manipulate God, which is what we do a lot, isn't it? It's one of the challenges that we have. He's saying, no, you need to instead submit yourself to God and submit yourself to a relationship with him. And then he says, don't be a mutilator. He's talking about circumcision and he's being pretty crazy. He's literally linking up the idea of the Baal worshippers, mutilators, with those who are practicing outward circumcision. He's saying to do that kind of fleshly mutilation is the same as those who are practicing Baal worship. He says, don't go there. There's no health there. Instead, let your hearts be the ones that are circumcised. After all, that's what the law pointed to. If you look at back in the law at Deuteronomy, what it says there is circumcise the foreskin of your heart and don't be stubborn any longer. Deuteronomy 30 and the Lord your God will be the one who circumcises your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you'll be saved. What he's saying is that spiritual circumcision is what is important. And so he sets across dogs, evildoers, and mutilators with those who worship by the Spirit, glory in Christ, and have no confidence in anything but Christ. And this is an important reminder for us. For those of us who are Anglican, who enjoy our liturgy, we have a great liturgy. It's one of the best liturgies that are in the English language, and it's beautiful. But if you're not careful, you can become so attracted to the liturgy and the practices that you miss the point. I love liturgy. I, I, I've been schooled by one of the guys in the diocese that is like at the top of the game with liturgy. When I say the right um, one liturgy and we get to the word oblation, I don't mispronounce it. I say oblation. You know, I make sure that I, I'm really fastidious about the right pronunciation and the right cadence and all of that. But if I'm not careful, then all of that becomes nothing. I lose my focus in the focus of mere earthly things. And rather than letting them draw us to Christ, they become things which draw us away from Christ. What we should be doing is letting Christ change our hearts and realizing that all the things that we do, whether it be the robes, the stole, the communion, that it's all a tool to design to bring us closer to Christ. But it is secondary, third, tertiary to knowing Christ, that he is the primary object of all of our spiritual practice. A great corollary would be baptism, right? Think about baptism. When we do baptism, I am always amazed that people that have never been in church come and remind me that they're members of the church. When we were at Holy Cross, been there for eight years, every once in a while somebody would come into the office and it was my turn on the rota to do baptisms and they would come in and they'd introduce themselves and they'd say, yes, I've been a member of this church for 20 years. I'm going, how come I haven't seen you for the past eight? You know, it was not even on Christmas and Easter, but now all of a sudden you want to get your baby done. That's not the right idea of what baptism is all about. Baptism is an outward expression of inward and visible, invisible faith. It's something that's happening on the heart that should express on the outside. You see, here's the deal. If baptism, which is a good corollary to circumcision, if baptism is about blessing the water and doing the liturgy right, then why don't we just take some hoses and put them out so that they sprinkle all those cars on 17, right? We'll say the liturgy, we'll do it all right, we'll have some good songs, Frank will lead the music, it'll be awesome. And then all of those people from Ohio will finally be saved. 
You see, if it would work, you guys would be like, let's do it. But we all know it won't work. You can't save people from Ohio. I'm from Ohio. And I can tell you that it's only by the grace of Jesus Christ that I'm here. It's the truth for all of us. If we're basing things on externals, then we're going to miss the point. We're going to not aim for the right thing because what happens is the dogs are not really outside. They're in our hearts. They roam inside of our hearts trying to convince us that there is power in our flesh, but there's none. We're, in fact, powerless. C.S. Lewis says in The Great Sin, an article in Mere Christianity, if we find that our religious life is making us feel that we are good above all, that we're better than someone else, I think we may be sure that we are being acted upon not by God, but by the devil himself. How do we deal with the dogs that are inside of ourselves? We remember that we are here by grace and grace alone. It's a wonderful prayer that said right after the communion liturgy, right before receiving communion in the right one uh, set, and it's this. We do not presume to come to this your table Merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under thy table, but thou art the same Lord whose property is always to have mercy. Think about that prayer. When we come, we don't come with rights and privileges. We come with open-handedness, and that's it. Because we have nothing to offer the Lord and everything to receive. You see, it doesn't matter how accurate you are if you're aiming at the wrong goal. We need to move from religion to relationship. We need to remove ourselves from self-confidence to confidence in Christ. Look at verse 4. He says, Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. He adopts what they would consider a good resume and says it's really not much. He's saying, I was circumcised on the eighth day, which means his mom had to be close enough to the temple to have the baby in proximity to the temple so that he could get there on the eighth day. That is a Jewish family. She is really dedicated, right? born and bred an Israelite, that he was from the right tribe. He was from the tribe of Benjamin, which if you look at the history, they're the ones that are always faithful, always there. He's a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He spoke Aramaic, and he's, not a, he's nothing but a purebred. He is one of the people. And then, as it regards to the law, he's a Pharisee. Now, what does that mean? Remember the old Sunday school way of understanding what a Sadducee is and a Pharisee is? The Sadducee is the religious party. They don't believe in the resurrection, and so they're sad, you see. The Pharisees, equally silly way of listen, learning things, the Pharisees are all about meticulous uh, following of the law. They're fair, you see. What he's saying is that everything I'm doing, I'm living my life before Christ with fairness in mind, making sure that the rules are followed, making sure that, that everyone gets their due, that everything is done in that way, and he had zeal. But here's what happens. If you have zeal that's based on religious externals, it'll crush your inner soul such that you will begin to murder. That's what he says there. He goes on to persecute the church. He was murdering Christians. Unless you think, oh, I would never do that. Just think about the way you live your life. If you're living a life that's based on religious externals, then when you get into ministry and something doesn't go your way, you start to kill other people. Not externally, but with your eyes. Bless her heart. You begin to crush your children with expectations. You begin to, to hurt others and neighbors and friends around you because of the way that you think they should have done what they did. And what he's saying is that'll crush you, it'll kill you, and it'll kill everybody else. So what should you put your trust in? You should put it in Christ and in him alone. Verse 7, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss. All assets are null and void because of Christ. It's the only thing that matters. See, self-righteousness is a liability. Joy comes from following Christ and seeing what he's done for us. 
So you can live your life based on duty, or you can live your life based on devotion and love. And here's how the, the two work. John Piper has a wonderful uh, illustration of this. John Piper talks about how he and his relationship, um, uh, he buys a flower for his wife for every year that they've been married. And so he sets up this scene. He says, imagine on our 50th anniversary, and he had one recently, imagine the 50th anniversary. I show up at the door of our house, and he always knocks on the door as if it's the first time he's met her. Imagine that I show up at the door, I knock on the door, and I have 50 roses. And she says, oh, Johnny, thank you so much. And he says, it's my duty. That is a worthless anniversary. <laughs> you just flushed it down the toilet, buddy. Right? It's my duty to love you. What? You blew it. That's the same thing with Christ. If we're here because it's our duty to be here, then we're missing something in the heart. Our hearts need to be changed such that we see what Christ did for us. We see that it's applied to us in spite of us. And because we realize how big a sinner we are and how great a Savior he is, our hearts rejoice. We need to shift from religion. We need to shift from earning. We need to shift to receiving and receiving the knowledge of Jesus. Look in verse 8. Indeed, I count everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. What he's saying is, just like he said when he said, work out your own salvation, he's saying, doing the math. Do the math of your life. All the things that you've tried to do for Christ are nothing but a dung pile. Rubbish. They're worthless compared to what Christ has done for you. He's saying he's lost everything. And he has. He's lost freedom. He's in jail. He's lost family. He's lost his friends, all of his relationships, all of the things that he had before when he was a Pharisee. He lost all of that, but he doesn't consider it a loss. He considers finding Christ to be that much better. He finds going past the past experiences into something that is present and ongoing, and that's a relationship of knowing Christ Jesus, knowing him personally, experiencing him, such that faith becomes a benefit because it's founded on faith in Christ. You see, everybody has faith. Everybody has faith in something, right? They have faith in something that will either lead them to the ability to be thankful and joyful or faith in something that they have to worry about. Worrying about, did I do enough? Worrying about, did I do the right thing? Worrying about all of those things. That's faith in human-centered religion, but faith in Christ? Well, you can relax because you know that the God of the universe has seen everything you did wrong this week. He saw it all. And he chose to die for you in spite of you. Religion moves you to do what you do out of fear, insecurity. But relationship moves you into relationship with God. You see, here's the deal. There are two kinds of people in the world that come to church every single Sunday. There are people who obey because that'll make them accept with God. And there are people who are motivated by the gospel. They realize that they're already accepted because of God, Christ's grace. And because of that, they obey. The outcome's the same. They still obey the Ten Commandments. They still pray. They still take communion. But that motivation of the heart changes everything. Religion causes fear. Relationship with Jesus Christ gives joy. And it leads you to what is that primary goal? To know him. Look at verse 10. He says, All of this is that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection of the dead. I love that last little bit. That by any means possible I may attain the resurrection of the dead. What he's saying is, in essence... I don't understand how it would be possible except for Christ. I don't see how I could get here except for what God has done. I don't see how I could be forgiven for everything that I've done in the past. 
except that it's a surprising serendipity from Jesus himself given to me. See, it doesn't matter how accurate you are if you're aiming at the wrong goal. Shift from religion, shift from self-confidence, shift from earning to Christ himself. So famous um, preacher D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, he used to always ask people as they came into his office, are you a Christian? You've probably heard me say this before, but it's a good diagnostic. If someone were to ask you, are you a Christian? Your response says a lot about who you are. If your response is, of course, why would you dare to ask that? Then you're probably basing things on your external religion. Equally, if you say, well... I hope so. You're probably also basing it on performance. But if someone asks you, are you a Christian? And you kind of laugh at yourself and realize, yes, but I'm not sure how God works out the math. Then it's probably because you're based on joy, realizing that he's done everything for you. So ask yourself that question today. Ask it throughout the week. Let it be a diagnostic for your soul that evaluates, are you aiming for the right goal, which is Jesus Christ, or are you aiming for something less than? Let us pray. Lord Jesus, guide us into your presence in such a way that we do see how we live and how we act. Judge us based on our attitudes such that we may evaluate and see and come out the other side of that with a newfound joy based on you and you alone in what you've done for us in spite of us. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Please stand and let's say to